So yeah, we have two more grants that just were filled. One was for a maker space in uh -huh. the media center nice. of an elementary school. And one was for a fifth grade teacher who's teaching um, math collaboratively. And she wanted these huge sort of desk, desk sized whiteboards mm. where students can work on math collaboratively together on the same whiteboard right. and then they can use them to teach other kids from their whiteboards so it's she's got like this whole system um which i thought was phenomenal but those are the kinds of things that you know teachers are asking us for like four large whiteboards it was you know 150 dollars like right. Mm -hmm. But that's what she needed to make her kids achieve that next level. everyone we are super excited to have Dale Ioannidis from the great state of Georgia the city of Atlanta with us on the My K-12 Career Show to share her story her journey with our viewers and our listeners. Miss Ioannidis has been working in the field of education since the mid-90s. Her heart her passion is with students that are in the greatest need and she is pivoting from public education into the nonprofit sector and so I'm really excited to do that deep dive with her on that. So we're gonna get right into it. Dale, thank you so much for coming on the show. Can you please share your story with our viewers and our listeners and what's going on in your life and your career right now? Sure, well, I've been in education, as you mentioned, for many, many years, been around the block. And I have taught in lots of different places and lots of different socioeconomic environments. And most recently here in Atlanta, I've been working at schools and I, in the same district, moved mm. from one side to the other side. Mm. And what I noticed really right away was just the amount of money that schools have with which to operate. Like, yeah. it is just fascinating to me how with schools that, you know, if you look at tax bases and mm -hmm. how money is allocated out, you know, there's algorithms for it. And so it should be relatively e fair, right? Right, right? But then what ends up happening is even at Title I schools, it depends on what the capacity of the families are. Wow. So, you know, working on one side of town where there was maybe that right at that Title I cutoff. And Title I is where uh, there's a minimum of 40% of families who are receiving free and reduced lunch services. And so if you have 40%, then that means the 60% of the families are not, and they might have the capacity to then make some donations to a PTA or a foundation, for example. Right. And in my experience, it's we're, we're not just talking a little bit of money. Generally, when schools have both of those things, we're talking 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars a year that they have to get rid of so that the next year when they do their fundraising, they can say that they used the funds and then try to get even more. So it's it's not just a little bit, it's quite a bit. And then when you go to a school that also is Title I and in the same district, but if it's a school where the families don't have that capacity. And so there's a higher free and reduced lunch rate, you know, and, and typically these schools that I'm referring to might have, you know, might be in like the 90% somewhere in there. And so those families don't have the capacity to have a PTA or a foundation. And what ends up happening is the teachers who are trying to do the best that they can for students really don't have the same amount of materials. And so what I noticed right away 
As an instructional coach, I worked with all of the teachers in the area of literacy Mm -hmm. at my school, and I had some new teachers last year, Mm. brand new, like fresh, just out of college. So Mm. first of all, many um, industries, people are paid in arrears. Like I totally understand that. But in education, it's a little bit different, and I don't think people know this. I might come in in middle to the end of July to Mm -hmm. start working and school starts August 1st. Yeah. Technically that's when like your pay period starts. Yeah. But you then don't get paid until the end of August. So mm. I'm a brand new teacher. Yeah. I don't have stuff from my last classroom to bring with me, yep. right? I'm walking into a school that does not provide any extra reimbursement for classroom items, but I'm not going to get paid until the end of August, but kids are there on August 1st. And there is no other industry where this happens to workers, Yes, right? And so then we're talking also about student capacity. Yep. So if I live of no fault of my own, right, on the side of town where families don't have the ability to make these types of donations, I'm not having the same transitional experience that other kids are. Like I think about my child, right, Mm -hmm. and his first days of school. And oftentimes he would come home and talk about all the stuff and all the different parts of the classroom and, you know, the library section where they can pick out their own books, whatever, right? Like, Mm -hmm. and then they sometimes will even come home with like a little project that they did in school that first day, you know, or something like that. That is not happening in these schools. So I'm a teacher. I might not even have notebooks or organizational like little baskets for the desks right and then these are kids who also are behind due to the pandemic so it's like there's so many different layers to this issue but really what i'm looking at is trying to make a difference for those title one schools that don't have ptas and foundations because i think that if a teacher can start on day one Mm. with a really positive transition that the kids are going to benefit from that. The transition will go smoother. You'll have less behavior issues. And if there's less behavior issues, then particularly as a new teacher, I can focus more on academics and content delivery. So it's, and I don't think anybody knows this. Like, I mean, you know, when I start talking to my friends about this, they have no idea or teachers in schools on the north side of town right like when i tell them what my experiences was or at the schools on the south side they had no idea they they, i think people really you just don't know what you don't know right and so one thing i want to say if there are any new teachers listening or you know folks new in the game I encourage everyone to travel and mm. and to maybe take some positions teacher wise that you might not think of at first. Oh. I think that you know and we were kind of talking about this a little bit before where I started working in Georgia early 2000s mm-hmm. and there was a huge influx of non-English speaking students sure. at that time teachers were not ready. Mm. I was new to the district and had come from a more diverse part of the country. So like I was, you know, that that was in my toolbox already. But for these teachers, they just were blindsided. And I was like, oh, that's because you, you know, and I I kind of make these observations. You've been teaching here for the, in the same school building for 20 years. And it's not, it hasn't changed, but communities change. There's always influx and there is always, you know, gentrification. There's all kinds of things that can affect that, but affect the type of students that might be coming into your class room too. So I think that traveling and just seeing what else is out there, like going to community meetings and just things that you might not think of can really help you and your impact as a teacher. That's so true. You know, I live in Seattle and of course, you know, 
what we're talking about is a socioeconomic issue, more on the economic side. And I think about even my daughter's school, you know, she's in a dual language school. Of course, my wife is Colombian, so we were very purposeful and intentional in where we wanted her and my son to go to school. He actually graduated from there. He's in middle school, but my daughter is still in that elementary school. And the one thing I will tell you is that you're right. And yes, why is this like that in every city? Like you have a north side and a south side. South side. So, we, so we live on the north side and my daughter goes to school. You know, I remember going to the fundraiser and they raised two hundred fifty thousand dollars in one night. <laughs> yep. One and night. It all goes to classrooms. One night, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, a quarter of a million dollars. And I can tell you from firsthand knowledge that there are very few schools on the south side that can even come to 10 percent of that. And so for me, it is heartbreaking because even though we're talking about the exact same district, even though we're talking about a country like the United States, where we do try to be very, very fair as it relates to our funding dollars and making sure that, you know, the schools that are in greatest need get more proportionally, it still is not equal. You know, it's not, it's not, it's like, you know, and you see the difference and, and my daughter do- and my daughter and my son, they have a phenomenal education so far. And that foundation is so critical, especially when you talk about what you do, which is literacy. If you don't have that foundation and literacy, if you don't go from learning to read to reading to learn, <laughs> I don't you're not going to make it like you're going to be constantly playing catch up. And that's what I think happens a lot of times in our inner city schools, our schools that have the greatest need is that the students don't get what they need foundationally. And like you said, it starts in the classroom. And if that teacher is spending the first six weeks to two months just trying to play catch up with just resources, right? It makes it super difficult. So is that where you are wanting to go with your foundation? Yes. So we actually are up and running. And so I, yes. So I didn't go back to work this year. Okay. I decided that I kind of tried to do it half and half. And what I realized about my own capacity was being at a school really made it difficult to do almost anything else. Mm. Like, so I was trying to set aside a few hours every day where I could kind of get us up and running. Mm -hmm. And every day that I was like, I came home, I couldn't do it. I was exhausted. I needed to just debrief on the couch. I'll do it tomorrow. And then tomorrow just never came. And we made the decision that if, you know, I had a board at that point, like if we really want to get this thing running, we need it to be where someone's really doing it. And so I didn't go back to work this year. And so we have given away six grants. I actually just ordered the items for two more this morning. So yeah, we have two more grants that just were filled. One was for a maker space in the media center. Nice. of an elementary school. And one was for a fifth grade teacher who's teaching um, math collaboratively. And she wanted these huge sort of desk desk sized whiteboards mm. where students can work on math collaboratively together on the same whiteboard. Right. And then they can use them to teach other kids from their whiteboards. So it's, she's got like this whole system, um, which I thought was phenomenal, but those are the kinds of things that you know, teachers are asking us for like four large whiteboards. It was, you know, $150. Like, right. mm-hmm. But that's what she needed to make her kids achieve that next level, right? Because sure. like, that's a, something that's a little bit of a new idea. I don't think I've ever seen a teacher do that in math before. Mm-hmm. You know, so we've got teachers out there who really have the energy and the innovation they're just not able to purchase it themselves. We also do special project grants. So we have two different grants. We have a beginning of the year one, and that is just for brand new teachers that will solve, or at least attempt to solve one of the layers come to the problem that I've explained. But then we also, after that beginning of the school year time, like September on, we offer special project grants and that can be for any teacher at a title one school um, who just has something missing or broken or needed in their classroom. 
So you're saying that the only requirement is that the teacher be working in a Title I school? Is it Title I elementary, basically? So we do all grade oh, okay. levels, K through 12, yep. And we use a rubric. So, okay. I mean, theoretically, someone who isn't at a Title I school could apply, mm -hmm. but they won't then get the points for being at a Title I school, right? Oh, so ideally, we're looking for Title I without a PTA or a foundation. Those would tend to score higher on the rubrics. And, and those have been out of, I would say we've had 13 applications, and I think only one came from a school that wasn't Title I. Okay. Or that didn't have, a, like, had a foundation or a PTA, but they were still Title I. But they earned the points and were able to get the grant. So did you just start this? What, first of all, what's the name of it? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh, right? I should have said that way a long time ago. It's called School is In. School is In. I love it. Yep. And we are a 501c3. So we've mm -hmm. got like everything going. And actually, we want a grant this year too. It was little, but mm -hmm. much appreciated. And it's to be able to say that we got a grant. So that is helpful. And we did really well on um, Giving Tuesday as well. That's so nice. we're we're up and running. If we added it all up, let's see, 15, we've probably given away $2,000 in grants. Okay, yes. that's good. We service any school in the country. Okay. We are, though, focusing on the maze cluster right now because okay. that's the schools I have a connection with. Sure. And we're also, in 2024, going to reach out and expand into Douglas, Carver, and Washington clusters okay. within Atlanta Public Schools. Mm -hmm. because those schools scored the lowest on last year's GMAS. Okay. They are only at like a 13 to 15 percent proficiency that's rate. Yeah, that's rough. That's rough. It is that low. Mm. So we want to try to start with those clusters to really support those teachers and, and what we're going to do is also collect data, right? So like, we're going to focus in on these clusters because they need the support, but then it's also going to hopefully provide us with some outcome data and how this might positively impact students. Love it. That's really good. Yeah. You're doing a really good thing. And truthfully, there's so much need. And I'm saying this is someone that started my career in, in the Atlanta area. Yeah. There's such a need there. Like I can absolutely see this, you know, being, something that totally consumes you right there in the city of Atlanta, because I mean, it's just such a need. I mean, just in Atlanta city schools, we're not even talking about, I can name Fulton, Clayton, I could go on and on, but you know what I'm saying? Because it's right. such a need, such a need. So yeah, I think that you really are on something. Tell us more about, you know, the foundation and how people can, you know, connect with you in terms of, you know, giving if they want to give and, you know, maybe somebody that's a part of an organization or a company? How, how does that work? Yeah, it's really interesting. So I think I had mentioned to you that right now, I feel like 80% of my job is a talking game. Like what? I am trying to get out and, you know, build some name recognition so mm -hmm. people at least know who we are, of course, try to fundraise. And so it's strange only because I'm new. I'm sure that anyone that has worked in nonprofits is like, hey, yeah, that's part of the process, right? Sure, sure. So we're brand new. It's kind of like, you know what happens when you're new at anything? Mm -hmm. And they'll tell you, well, we're not going to hire you because you're new. But then you're like, well, how am I ever going to get experience <laughs> yeah, if nobody will hire me, right? Yeah. It's kind of that same thing. Yeah. So. I will apply to grants, like mm -hmm. large grants, right? That sure. are foundation type things. And the the feedback is always great, but it's like, well, you know, we only fund A, B, and C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because you're new and you don't have three years of financial statements and you don't have mm. um, partnerships, you know, that, sorry. So it's like, well, how am I supposed to get that yeah, if you don't? Yeah. Need? So um, a lot of what I'm doing right now is just what I'm doing right now, yeah. right? Like talking and trying to spread the word, try to explain to people. I think that it's hard because people don't know they don't understand. Mm -hmm. You sort of have to align your messaging with the recipient. Yes. Right. Like I am fully aware that 
I look like a privileged white lady, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and here I am coming in and I feel like I don't, like, I want this to be an idea of hope, not yeah. of fixing, right? Like, oh, I don't need to come in and fix you. Right, right. It's that you can fix your own selves if you have a fair playing field. Sure. And so you're not I fixing, think you're like assisting. Yeah. a lot of this is just messaging, listening, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. We do have, um, I have a meeting coming up with a large organization. It's a health organization that's here mm -hmm. in Georgia, and they do a lot of work in the same area where I am working okay. and they don't have the connection in though. And so we're hoping in 2024 where I can connect with this big organization yeah. because then to be able to say that I've got this partnership with, sure. with, with you know, it uh, right away, people are going to be like, Oh, you work with them. So, you know, that's kind of part of this work right now too. So my website is schoolisin.org. Okay. It's just the name of our organization.org. So very simple to find. And then on Twitter and Instagram, we are school is in today. I love uh, it. And those are in both of those accounts. We also have LinkedIn. We'll make sure that all of your contact information and your information about your organization, your foundation is in the show notes so that people can connect with you because yeah what i see is a huge need and you're just trying to meet that need so it's really good and i commend you for doing that because you know it truly does take a village to raise our children and you have identified a need through your 20 plus years of working in this amazing field that consistently gets overlooked and it might not seem like a big deal to somebody but you know, an extra two, three, five hundred dollars to a teacher to start the school year is priceless. And then when you start talking about specialty grants, especially with all the changes that are going on in our country and the world and making sure that our children that are marginalized anyway don't get even further behind because right. they're not being exposed to things like artificial intelligence and all that's going on with what's changing in our world. I think it's super important to have an organization like yours that is trying to fill in the gap because, yeah, in most schools, whether it's inner city or affluent schools or urban or suburban or rural, it doesn't matter. You're going to get the basics. Yeah, you're going to get the reading, the writing, the math. And in some cases, kids aren't even getting that. But then when you start adding in, like I said, all of these other things that are coming down the pike and that are already here as it relates to our ever-changing world, it just means that our most marginalized students are getting further and further behind. That's right. So, yeah, I commend you for what you're That's doing. That's right. It's very much needed. Donors Choose, which I'm sure many to you know what it is, right? They just released all of that data from the surveys, and they show that on average, teachers spend over $670 a year out of their own money, right, wow. for classroom materials. And I know for sure, I've, I'm sure, oh, yeah. 100%. 100%. Spent, right, in a year, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But that, of course, Black teachers spend more mm -hmm. and teachers at Equity First Schools spend more, over mm -hmm. $700. So mm -hmm. again, we're talking about, you know, teachers who have a more difficult job because of all of the challenges. 100%. They're spending all of this money. And then if you're at one of these schools, you're not getting reimbursed. No. It's absurd to me <laughs> that yeah. this is happening, you know, and just the layers of that, like here in Georgia, the Georgia Department of Education mm -hmm. released that they believe in the next five years, over 40% right. of our teachers are going to leave in the next five years. Wow. So you know where they're leaving, right? Like if I'm at a school where I'm getting all of the support that I need, I'm, I'm going to be less likely to leave. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, again, these kids who are already behind because of lots of reasons, and now they're going to be the ones that are constantly with new teachers because of the turnover. Yeah. It's just, there's so many layers, Joseph. It's crazy. It, it's so true. And, and, and like I said, I, I worked in Atlanta as a teacher, a coach, an assistant principal, a principal. And then, you know, worked in Missouri and St. Louis and Kansas City, which those are you know, inner city school districts as well. And I can remember, and the last time I worked in St. Louis was 2016. So now we're talking about eight years. 
And I still keep up with some of the teachers that work for me. And I will tell you, there are subs that were subbing for me, long-term subs, six, seven, eight, nine years ago, okay, that are still subbing, long-term subs, like have never left that particular classroom. Because like you said, when you start talking about all these teachers that are leaving, a lot of them are leaving from inner city schools, right? But then those schools already had shortages anyway, right? right? And so that's really concerning to me that we don't, and a lot of times it is a resource issue. Yeah, there's other issues, there's other factors, but in so many ways, the right funding, the right resources can be a great equalizer. And like I said, I, it just harps back to what you have identified and what you're trying to do. I really feel like you're going to get a lot of support for this to make this work. And I'm happy to have you on the show. And this doesn't have to be the last time you come on the show, because maybe you come on every six months or so and give an update on how things are going. And that way we can continue to get that message out because it is needed. It's very much needed. And I've been in this profession about as long as you've been in this profession. And I can tell you, it's very concerning to me that a whole lot of the issues that we were dealing with when we first got into this in the mid nineties, we're still dealing with it. And that's it's sad to me. It's sad to me that we could have had this conversation 25 years ago and we would say, okay, these are the top 10 issues. And guess what? 25 years later, they're still the same top 10. Yeah. Issues. That's a problem, you know? And so I commend you and it takes a leap of faith, right? Like you could very easily be in North Atlanta in a, in a really nice position, just, you know? Yeah. And so I commend you for being willing to do this and you have my 100% support and we're going to definitely make sure that we get all of your information in the show notes so that we can, you know, continue to spread the word about your organization. Can you share with our audience again the name of your organization, where you're located, how we can keep in touch with you? And yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to. So the name of our nonprofit is School is In. Mm hmm. And we are located in Atlanta. We have a great board. As a matter of fact, we are still looking to build it, though, no. just to have some diverse voices, you know, because I've got lots of friends who have worked on boards that I've had come in. We do have a wonderful community college prof who has joined our board and you know so we've got a lot of really neat people but we oh, i'm always looking okay how many what, people are on your board is it a five seven, right nine? now right now five okay but i'm hoping for seven and okay. of course you know any kind of committee volunteer type stuff would sure. be great too especially once we get going but what's been difficult for me is mm -hmm. finding someone in those clusters I've mentioned, mm. like, and I've really tried, you know, and sort of got into a couple people's ears. But when I say, Hey, do you know anyone? Everyone's like, they don't know anyone who has the capacity. Oh. Right. I think everyone just feels like they're being pulled in too many different places. So that's like an open casting call to anyone in South Atlanta or or West, the West side or really the East side too. Like, okay. you know, we have lots of different opportunities for that. But we are on Twitter and Instagram okay. and our handles are school is in today. Okay. And then let's see. Oh, email is dale at school is in. Dell at school dot org dot org. Love it. Well, we again, like I said, we're super grateful that you came on the show to tell us about school is in. That was really awesome. But before you leave, Dale, can you leave our viewers and our listeners with some parting words of wisdom? And then we'll say goodbye. Yeah. Um, I think it really goes back to the beginning of our conversation when I was talking about some of my experiences. I don't think we got this on camera, but we were talking about like I had worked on a Navajo reservation and then I had worked like in Newark, New Jersey. You know, I've worked in some very privileged places as well. And I think that as a teacher, if I could do it all again, I would not change a thing. For a while, I, w I was worried about that. Like when I would go to job interviews and they would see, oh, like you were here one year and then up, oh, you were only here one year and then up, oh, you were here for three years, but then you moved again. That's just kind of how I was when I was younger. I would go and really immerse myself. And then it was so much that I kind of needed to like, I had to go, right? Yeah. 
And looking back on that and reflecting on it, I see that now though, as so valuable as a teacher, Mm -hmm. like just being exposed to different points of view and different ways of thinking about things, as well as being exposed to different cultures and how they saw me. Mm. Right. So like when I was on the Navajo reservation, oftentimes when I walked by another teacher in class in the hallway and I greeted them or made eye contact, the teacher would walk right by me. Mm -hmm. And that was such an experience. It did. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand it. And I was young, right? Like I didn't get Mm -hmm. it. And now I was like, she was mad. Like, there was a whole lot of political stuff, right, that I wasn't aware of. But again, like a white woman coming into a community that looked different. And sometimes I wasn't accepted because of that. Mm -hmm. And so I had to work. And but the work was really listening and exposure, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just really encourage any teacher out there, if you have any opportunity to go try something different or something new, I think that it just opens up your teaching perspective so much. Love it. And that would be my word of wisdom. (laughs) That was awesome. Y'all heard it from Dale. You need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. That's right. Sometimes that's That's right. (laughs) How you grow, right? That's right. So again, we are so grateful that you came on the show and um, we just wish you all the best. This won't be the last time. I definitely want to do anything I can do to help. But yeah, I'm very grateful that you came on the show and um, we're going to get the word out. We're going to help you continue to build so you can continue to help these teachers that are in need of that support and those resources. Thank you so much. No, sir. Thank you.